further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bilal Phillips. Thank you very much for your time. This is Dr. Bilal Phillips. Thank you very much for your time. Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the Book of Allah, and the best source of guidance is the guidance brought by Muhammad. 
And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. For every innovation in religion is cursed. All cursed innovation leads to misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire. So said Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today, I would like to share with you a hadith which is particularly significant in our times and in Canada, in the West. It is a hadith which addresses us. When we look at the world today and we see the degeneration, the corruption, the crumbling of our homelands, our countries, and we see Muslims in the worst state possible, whether it's issues of Jerusalem being taken from our hands, or it's our brothers and sisters slaughtered in Myanmar, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. It would seem that we are the worst of generations. We all know that the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Khairul Nasi, Qarni. The best of generations is my generation. Thumma al-ladheena yalunahum. Thumma al-ladheena yalunahum. Then those who follow them, and those who follow them. So if we continue that process of following, getting worse and worse, it would seem as though we are at the worst <coughs> possible stage. However, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a hadith, an authentic narration found in Musnad Ahmed and Bayhaqi and others, he asked his companions a question in order to bring out an understanding for the generations to come. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu oftentimes began explaining things about Islam by asking a question. I'm sure you're familiar with so many hadiths he asked. <coughs> so many different occasions he began his explanations with a question. And this is a part of the prophetic guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would teach with questions. Today, modern educationalists say the best way to teach is with a question. It's called the inquiry model. Rather than going in the classroom, as most of us learn, the teacher comes in and states things, writes on the board, gives you a textbook, whatever, So you learn by rote memorization of whatever is said, and you give it back on the exam. This is not the best way for learning. In fact, it's the worst way. The best way is through understanding. So the Prophet ﷺ, on an occasion, addressed the Sahaba saying, Ayyul khalqi a'jabu imana? Who among the creation has the most amazing faith? 
The Sahaba immediately replied, the angels among Allah's creation, it would be the angels. But the Prophet ﷺ said, the angels? The angels receive the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They receive commandments from Allah. How could they not believe? So this Habba said, well, uh, then the prophets, the messengers, and Nabi you. And the Prophet said, Prophets? The prophets who received that revelation after it was given to the angels, passed on to them, they received revelation, sometimes directly Allah speaking to them, etc. How could they not believe? So they said, the Sahaba, those people who were around the prophets, not necessarily meaning themselves, <coughs> but the Hawari, the Sahaba of Isa, Musa, etc. And the Prophet ﷺ said, How could they not believe? They were there with the prophets. They saw the miracles of the prophets, etc. So they were stuck. Where to go from there? Who else could be the most amazing of the creation with regards to their belief? So the Prophet ﷺ went on to say, لكن أعجب الناس إيمانا قوم يجيئون من بعدكم فيجدون كتابا من الوحي فيؤمنون به ويتبعون فهم أعجب الناس إيمانا The ones with the greatest and most amazing faith would be the people who would come after you, who would find a book of revelation, believe in it, and follow it. They are the most amazing among creation in faith. This hadith addresses us. We were not Sahaba. Definitely not prophets or angels. We are those who have come and we have the book of Revelation, the Quran. And we believe in it. This is a Bushra, glad tidings from the Prophet ﷺ to us. However, he said that they would find a book and believe in it. Not merely read it, because this is the problem of our times. That the Quran, that book of revelation, is perhaps the most read book in the world. The most read book in the world. We read the Quran many more times than the Christians read the Bible. But reality is that we read it culturally as a ritual. So we read the Quran in Ramadan. Most of us outside of Ramadan, we don't even read the Quran. Some of us, we read it when we come to the masjid, 
but we just read it for the sake of reading it because we believe that in reading it there is Baraka blessing reward from Allah but we don't spend the time to understand it. And we teach our children to read it. And we have our children memorize it. And we're very happy when they complete the memorization of the whole Quran. However, in Canada here, if you go to the jails of Canada, you will find there are many Muslims. And among them are Muslims who memorize the whole Quran. They're in jail. Having committed the worst of crimes. Because of this disconnect, where the Quran, that book of revelation, which we were supposed to believe in, and to believe in it, we need to understand it, not simply believe in it because our parents believed in it and our grandparents believed in it, but believe in it because we have read it, understood it, and were convinced that this was revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because our belief is one of tradition, <coughs> habit, culture, and not one of understanding. Then the guidance which is in the Quran, which should guide us in our lives, we are not accessing. We are reading for Barakah, not for guidance. As a result, this book which Allah described as Hudan lil muttaqin guidance for those who fear Allah. It is not providing the guidance for the generation that is coming up here in Canada. And so we find, as I mentioned, in the jails of Canada, for father. When I visited the UK, the same thing. In the jails of the UK, for father, who memorized the Quran when they were used, but they became drug dealers, pimps, gangsters, murderers. They became all these things, but they were out with Quran. And worst of all, worst of all, what I found here in Canada, in each of my visits, I grew up in Canada, you heard already, but I've been living in the Middle East most of my life, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, UAE. So I come back regularly, at least once a year. And when I come back and I go to the masjid, I meet the brothers, Alhamdulillah, it's good to see their children are growing up. Inevitably, a brother will come to me and say, listen, I need you to talk to my son. About what? 
he says he's not a Muslim anymore. He doesn't believe in Allah. Even before I came here, two months ago, a sister called me up from Toronto. He said, brother, our son, had memorized the Quran when he was 10 years old. We are a practicing family. We've been for Hajj, Umrah, praying five times a day, everything. But when he became 15, he came home, and that was only a little while back. He came home and told us he didn't believe in Allah. <coughs> what should we do? We have other children. Should we kick him out of the house? He's 15 years old. Because to leave him in the midst of the others is going to harm them. What to do? That's another story. But the reality, and it's happening here in London. It's not just something for Toronto. It's happening here in London, Hamilton, Montreal, Winnipeg, Vancouver. It's happening all across the country. Young people leaving Islam. Though they were raised practicing families, they got the Quran, <coughs> yet and still, even those going to Islamic schools, yet and still, we have a wave of apostasy happening in our community from east to west. This is a challenge, the challenge of our time. And as Muslims, we have to address it. It's not enough to shake our heads and say, it's those people or it's those people. It didn't happen to me, I'm okay, my family's okay. It can happen, it can show up anytime. <coughs> Even those who feel that everything is perfectly okay, you can be surprised with it. So I ask Allah SWT to help us address this problem. <coughs> that we would wake up I ask him to guide us to find solutions for this problem. Forgive our negligence which has brought us to this point. Protect our offspring, the generation to come. Akulu kawli hadha mustafallah li wa lakum. ولسائر المسلمين من كل دم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته لا يردي. All praise due to Allah and Allah's peace and blessing be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. What is the solution? Where do we go from here? How do we correct this? How do we change this reality? Where is it coming from? Why? Part of the problem is us. We should be 
the solution, but instead we are part of the problem. Whether it is through our negligence, we have left our children, we're so busy chasing the dunya, we don't have time for them. So Islam is just a cultural habit. We do. Our parents did it, we do it. You're in our family, you're supposed to do it. So people do it because of that. Family pressure, community pressure. We have not taught our children Islam. We have done the ritual and they have imitated the ritual. <coughs> Just like every one of us who has had a child three years old. When you get up to pray, that child gets up to pray beside you. And when they do that, of course, something, it touches your heart. You say, MashaAllah, look at the little one. Our son or our daughter getting up to pray beside us. And this is something experienced by families all over. Because children, all children, it's not just Salah. If you were a Hindu, going to your idol and doing rituals with incense and putting food in front of the idol, and you had a three-year-old kid, they'll do the same thing too. It's not something special about Salah. It's just the nature of children. But at that age, they imitate their parents. That's the stage of imitation. But we don't realize that. We think it's something special. MashaAllah, this kid is you know, learning Salah. They're praying like we pray. And we're, everybody's happy about it. We give them some candy and they're happy, we're happy. When our friends come over, they will even get up and start to pray without us. And of course, when our friends see that, they say, MashaAllah, look at that. You know, what's happening is that the kid, the child, quickly learns that by imitating the parents, you get reward. Mom and dad will be happy. They will give you candy. When their friends come and they see you do it, they're even more happy and they give you more candy. And so you will do more and more and more. And if we leave them to understand Salah that way, we have doomed them to failure. The Prophet said, Teach the children Salah by the time they're seven. But what did he mean? That Salah? The one we're talking about where the kid gets up and... Is that what he was talking about? That's what most of us think. Ah, oh, just let them know how to make the prayer. But that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> one of the companions narrated that when he went with a group to accept Islam from his tribe, they went to accept Islam from the Prophet Wasallam. <laughs> in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ had them stay for some time to learn and then sent them back to the tribe. 
They went back and informed the tribe. They had accepted Islam from the Prophet ﷺ on behalf of themselves and the rest of the tribe. And when the time for Salah came, after they gave the explanation of their visit with the Prophet ﷺ, etc., time for Salah came, and they looked around to see who was going to lead the Salah, as the Prophet ﷺ had told them, the one who leads the Salah is the one who knows the most Quran. So he said, we looked around, and then it turned out it was me. I knew the most Quran. So from that day onwards, I led my tribe in Salah. And I was six or seven years at the time. Six or seven years at the time. <laughs> If he only knew to go the most emotions, could he lead someone? No. He had learned the salah well enough to lead the jama'ah. Means he knew what to do if anything happened, if he broke wudu. If you haven't taught a kid about wudu and what happens if you're the imam, what are they going to do? They lead the salah and they pass wind. No big deal. So you had to teach them all of the things concerning the salah. So that six or seven year old, he knew he had learned the salah. He understood the salah. All the rulings concerning it. That is what we're supposed to give them. The full understanding by the time they seven. And a major part of that full understanding is for them to understand that prayer is not to please mom and dad. That's not why we pray. We pray to give thanks to Allah. That is the essential message from that three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, that they understand that salah is to give thanks to Allah for everything. Everything which Allah created, everything that they have. We connect them, we educate them to understand Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Why Allah began our salah with alhamd? He could have begun it with other things. But he began it with alhamdulillah. Because that is the foundation of faith. You know who Allah is? Then you must give thanks to him. So that is the message we need to change, teach our children. And th that's just an example. There's, the rest of Islam has to come to them that way. That we take the time out to teach that to them. Otherwise, they will grow up with that three-year-old soul. One done to please parents. At, a three, at the age of three, there's no harm. That's as much as they can understand, whatever. But once they're able to grasp something beyond the physical, then we have to give them that message. And let them understand that message. Otherwise, they will grow up. And for them, Salah and the rest of Islam, will just be Riyā. That's what it will be. That will be their Islam. And that's why it's not surprising that we find young people, as soon as they reach the uh, teenagers, etc., et they're ready to take Islam off like our coats. Just take it off, hang it up. Go live another life. Because it was something they just did to please their parents. It wasn't something they understood, believed in, had faith on, 
<coughs> it was just a cultural habit and tradition. So this is what is in front of us. We have to educate our children properly to Islam. If we don't teach them properly, then their future is dim. This is why in most of the masjids that I've visited, we either find little kids below the age of 10, just above 10, 11, or bigger kids, adults, young adults, and older people. That's it. You have a gap of the teenage years where you don't see them in the masters. Where are they? Where are they? We will be asked. Each and every one of us is like a shepherd responsible for his flock. Allah is going to ask us about these children, these young people, who we failed because we were just too busy chasing the dunya. The simple solution was let them memorize the Quran. The Prophet said, Khairukum man ta'allamu Quran wa allama. The rest of you are those who memorize the Quran, who learn the Quran and teach it to others. But we changed it from the best of those, or uh, the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. We changed it to Khairukum man hafid al Quran wa hafada. The best of you are those who memorize the Quran and make other people memorize it. Is that the same? Is memorizing the Qur'an the same as learning the Qur'an? It's easy, just go with the memorization. But that was not the intent of the Prophet His intent was that we learn the Qur'an. Memorizing is a way to help us to learn, to retain, especially for those generations where there was no texts. You couldn't read and write. You couldn't, people didn't know how to read and write. They weren't available, etc. So memorizing was a necessity to preserve the text. But learning the Quran, that book of revelation that which we found, learning it is essential for believing in it. How can you believe in something you don't understand? You know it, you see it. You can give it a name and speak about it, but you can't believe in it if you have not understood it. So I ask Allah SWT to give us this understanding. This this desire, the desire to spread this understanding in our families. To take up the responsibility of educating our young ones to Islam. Making sure that they have understood the Quran. They believe in it because they are convinced of its authenticity. That in fact it was revelation from Allah. And not just merely repeating rituals that we have been repeating, which we learn from our parents, from their parents, etc. I ask Allah to be merciful on us to forgive our negligence and our sin in this matter. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change our hearts today so that we can change the future which is in front of us and make it a bright future for Islam and Muslims. 
ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من دونك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب أقيم الصلاة.